So I'm going to go very quickly through the initial piece because I've presented it uh, uh, in the last two presentations, and then we're going to go into some more details about the lunar initiatives, in particular the uh, special interest groups and the ideas we have for some of the challenges we may be uh, creating, some large dollar prize challenges. So uh, as, uh, as I explained, but to give some context, we're now in the age of the lunar renaissance. We had the golden age back uh, in the Apollo days, then we had the dark ages. Now we have an almost spontaneous renaissance of missions starting in 2007 when a country from around the world, uh, not just the US and Russia, uh, began uh, going to the moon. And so the moon is going to be a very eclectic place from now on. Um, the US missions can lead, but there's going to be a lot of company. And so the lunar initiatives were invented to begin to address and um, uh, give a container for all this activity. Uh, not all of these websites are up and active just yet, but over the next month or two, I plan to have uh, at least informational pages on all of them. And then we'll be creating one of the features of the lunar initiatives is this kind of ubiquitous communications process of all things lunar. Um, and as I said, here's the activities we've gone through. These are the workshops. We're going to now go from the workshops to down to SIGs and challenges in today's presentation. And the, the, the SIGs began more or less this year. The challenges will begin later this year and next year. The Lunar Switchboard is, is our attempts to organize and coordinate people from all over the world, getting them speaking to each other, getting them to attend events like this, and Space Cryo and other events that we attend. Uh, Pamela and I travel the world going to, to workshops uh, in space. So we're, we're well represented in the workshop world. Uh, so and then that's the three, the three workshop series that we have, Lunar Cubes, which will be next October. This workshop, Lunar Science Applications, and then Opportunities in Cis Lunar Space is our new project that should come up in uh, uh, November, hopefully, at DPS. And then the International Geophysical Year, going back to this, uh, this kind of note him, going back to the calendar, it's in 2017-18, which becomes kind of the focus. So as we're calling people and talking to people, it's the focus of where we're going to be three years from now and how you're going to play along. So now let's talk about the special interest groups. So the notional idea is that every each of the three workshop series will have between two to four special interest groups in a year or two. Uh, right now we have four that have started this year, and we'll hear from a couple of the, the SIG leaders, Bonnie and, and maybe a word or two from Pamela, about the uh, SIGs that they've created and the work they've already done. This piece is talking about kind of what was the original design model. So the idea was you get 10 to 20 or so qualified members. You do a monthly phone call, monthly webinar. Um, you work on joint papers. You work on joint proposals. And you present that these workshops. And so the idea is to create monthly activity in between the annual workshops. Um, and uh, within the first few months, we've got um, good participation. We've got a lot of interesting ideas. Um, and so it's, it's uh, really coming along. And then over time, we're going to expand it and structure it more along these ideas. And so the idea was to have a, a, a deep cryoengineering SIG, so cryogenic engineering, superconductor applications, um, cryogenic systems. Uh, then we look at cryogenic electronics, the kinds of things that uh, Mohammed was talking about, and creating a, a group that's focused on that. Um, and then cryogenic science, which is what I was talking about. I'm going to see if I can't get uh, people uh, presenting papers on places like Enceladus and uh, uh, Titan at the space cryo workshops and talking about those kinds of topics um, in, uh, in a monthly SIG. And what I talk about here is this. We haven't really covered this at all in this workshop. But one of the reasons I created this and one of these, this, this kind of content will also um, be as appropriate or perhaps more appropriate in the uh, Scientific Opportunities workshop series is one of my beliefs is that there's new and novel physics going on in these 40 Kelvin terrains. So far, there's clear evidence that a 40 Kelvin regolith is different than an 80 Kelvin regolith. And nobody's quite sure what the, some of those dis differences are. And so I believe there are opportunities for uh, fundamental new science and certainly fundamental new observations. No one's ever gone and dug in those soils and figured out how they're created and what kind of chemistry is going on at those temperatures. 
both in terms of the icy, uh, um, icy deposits on a place like the moon as well as the uh, icy environments uh, and liquid environments in places like Titan and Triton. Uh, and then we're going to eventually create an ISRU SIG um, because that's one of the main reasons people are going to the moon. Uh, the lunar cube SIGs, these are the ideas we had for that lunar networks. So with CubeSats, you're going to want to try and beam power, beam communications, distributed systems. Um, Pamela has a bunch of ideas about robot swarms and how those might work. So pull, pulling together and doing a, a special interest group on that kind of technology would make a lot of sense. Um, Cislunar mission management, especially with the, the kind of new mission that came to our attention just a couple of weeks ago, this idea of chasing mini moons around uh, the Earth-Moon system you're definitely going to have a very different type of mission management profile when you're talking about lots of small satellites uh, uh, anywhere between the Earth and L2 uh, in and around the moon or not. And so the communications challenges and the way you, I mean, you're not in Keplerian orbits anymore. You're in chaotic orbits. There's a lot of interesting things that are going to need to change to be able to do that well. Um, at some point, we'll also plug back into STEM and educational support. Uh, we're educating professionals at this point, but we'll want to be educating everyone as we go. Uh, the SOX SIGs, looking at plasmas and radiation, atoms and molecules, dust and regolith, um, the kinds of stuff we heard from AML, high field HTS magnets in dust and plasmas. There's a lot of interactions between those systems. That was what came up. You know, can you build frictionless bearings? non-contact bearings that would be ideal uh, for a litter setting. A um, lot of unanswered questions on, on how to do that. Um, and then let's see, the deep space cryogenics, I kind of did that. This, this, this idea here, I talk about macroscopic quantum mechanical effects and nonlinear processes. Um, high temperature superconductivity is, is a macroscopic quantum mechanical effect. You have uh, electrons behaving as though they were single electrons over distances of meters and even kilometers for the long cable. And there's a possibility that there could be other similar kinds of novel interactions when you're in a 40 Kelvin soil. Um, I doubt it's going to be superconductivity, but there are certainly many n very highly nonlinear processes that have never been studied before. Um, and there are many, so I think that once we start studying them, we'll discover many different things. So that's a flavor for the kinds of special interest groups we're going to be creating and how we might pull them apart. Um, so Bonnie, when you get a moment, um, uh, we'll talk about, uh, give uh, Bonnie a couple of minutes to talk in, in about the, the SIG they've created. And... <laughs> Uh, and then we'll give Pamela the mic for a couple of minutes to talk about her, her work group. Um, and Abraham has an active group, but we'll probably move on. But I wanted to get uh, the local team at least an opportunity. Yes, I am very happy to say that one of the three co-founders of our SIG, which is known as the Central Fall Community, is here with me today. Um, as you know, if you've looked at the agenda, tomorrow is jam-packed full of Kennedy people. I live here on the Space Coast and um, met James Fessmeyer, who is quite a celebrity at Kennedy. He's the um, superconductor guy and the cryogenics guy who I met because Russell, you and Greg met him up in D.C. in 2009 or 10. At Space Cryogenics. There you go. And about that same time, I met Mark Senti from AML because you had met, I guess that's who you met in yeah. DC. So I started getting myself into trouble here, networking, uh, building the network that I had already established in the business community, playing in the space community, and got to meet Jack Fox and you, Greg. And we started talking about what's going on here at Kennedy that we're about much more than launch today. And so the big thing, as we've talked about throughout the day, is this whole thing about compact CubeSats. And Kennedy's got a lot to contribute there, being experts in launch and payload integration with CASES and the Space Science Lab up there. So we decided to pull together 
the technology people, media people, educators in Central Florida who are interested in seeing us thrive in the new commercial space environment. We have had a couple of meetings and today and tomorrow are in part a result, certainly tomorrow is a part of the results of that group. And Greg and Jack are chairing up the technical team while when we're ready, I'm going to be working with the media and the educators. And that was the educational SIG you were talking about. That's part of it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the trouble you guys are getting into up at Kennedy? Well, um, again, I'm Greg Clements. Uh, I'm very happy to be one of the co-founders of the Central Florida CubeSat community. Um, you know, for NASA's changing, and there's a lot of emphasis on innovation and commercial space. We have to do a lot of work in collaboration uh, because, you know, one organization doesn't have all the resources or expertise to do it alone. So uh, what we have been noticing as we've been focusing very much on some of the, the bigger programs around the space industry, um, there's been a lot of work in collaboration, proposals, innovation, that has been going on around the agency and uh, for a variety of reasons up until now Kennedy has not been as strong a player as some of the other centers so you know currently for example there's a small uh, satellite technology initiative from the office of chief technologist that is going to cover certain initiatives so when we find out that Kennedy's the only center that really doesn't have some proposals or doing active work in there but they are utilizing some of the local universities and companies. It really makes you think, my goodness, we ought to do a better job of trying to collaborate across Central Florida because locally we have a lot to offer. And being in close proximity to a lot of expertise and a lot of capabilities, we can work together to really make a difference and try to you know, put our share in to the innovations that need to uh, be made to really foster uh, us to become a successful spacefaring nation in the future. So very happy to do that and really looking forward to those contacts and being able to, you know, uh, figure out some opportunities for collaboration in the future. Really good. Thank you for that. And as a, a concrete example of what the Lunar Initiatives were all about. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to introduce Pamela's mm -hmm. SIG because Greg, you're going to be sending somebody from our group to join Pamela SIG, again, that's part of the cross-pollination because you, Pamela, are working with people from many of the centers and educational institutions and companies. So, right, so I, I, I basically lead the Small Payloads and Advanced Concepts for Exploration uh, SIG, which is basically lunar cube, for, for lunar cubes. So the idea really is to support the development of uh, capable, low-cost, and compact instrumentation and supporting technology to support exploration activities throughout the solar system, of course, particularly on the moon, the nearest and dearest neighbor. And it presents an analog and a lot of interesting science for a lot of things that are going on all over the, uh, not just the solar system, but the universe. So a group of people, many of whom I've actually met through some of these workshops from uh, who are in small startups at NASA centers, at universities, scientists, engineers, programmatic folks, who come together once a month to A, uh, talk about uh, what they would like to get out of this and what they can offer, essentially, so they can get to voice their frustrations in dealing with their colleagues in science or engineering if they never get to, to voice in their own environment. And what we've done is we've started to have an opportunity for one of our group to do a presentation on a topic that's relevant to all of us. We're looking now at a couple of presentations on transportation options for getting to the moon and for operating in the moon or asteroid environments. And then what I'd like to do, what I'll initiate for the next time, is to actually put out there uh, five probably specific concepts that um, require some refining in terms of science and also some inputs to solve some of the technology challenges to make them happen. And ask the group as a whole to brainstorm on how to solve some of these problems. I'm doing this in advance of what I know will be announcements later this year 
to actually, um, you know, write proposals to actually that could that'll be subject to a review process to get selected to actually build some CubeSats. For example, on the EM1, which is the SLS that will be testing itself by going into orbit around the moon, they'll carry something like 12 CubeSats through. They'll be basically um, people get an opportunity to propose to build those through various programs uh, at NASA and any other opportunities that come along. So rather than wait for the opportunities to come along, we'll actually do this in advance and form teams. And in fact, I'm already working directly with um, Feathers Unlimited uh, as well as with Planetary Systems Corporation on some papers and, uh, and some proposals. So that's already come out of this effort, even though it's only been really going on for about So I'm optimistic that this will be very good in building collaborations and partnerships. Um, and it actually, I talked to the, uh, Peter Hughes, who's the chief technologist at uh, NASA Goddard, who said to me that he's really looking for some collaborative projects between NASA centers. Now, normally NASA centers compete with each other and they don't share technology development money. But I guess that the, one of the latest directives is for NASA centers to actually do some collaborative projects. So I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can work something that. out. Yes, good. No, thank you yeah. for that, Pamela. So please sign up for it, and, feel, and I'm, I'm always looking for people to join and participate in our discussions. They're very lively. Thank you for that. And now we'll hear from Abraham, who runs the Network SIG. So it's about communications networks and other kinds of networks in cislunar space. Hello. Yeah. Um, my name is Abraham Asant, and uh, I am proud to present the Lunar Network SIG. We had actually started from uh, January. Uh, my co-host is Mike Riley, uh, introduced through Pamela Clark, and we are doing pretty exciting job there as well. What we are trying, to, what we are doing, is to define a good deep space information system that would be suitable and uh, operational for at least like a 15, 25 year time frame. So. This is kind of a subdivided into a space segment, ground segment, and the communications. And we'll be addressing service level framework as well as the session and connectivity models between several nodes in the space segment and thousands of nodes in the ground segment. The idea is that both using the uh, hobbies, backyard, antenna, as well as a professional uh, industry grade uh, ground station, we are able to pool almost 24 by 7 operation on the earth for a connectivity and uh, session level management. As well as we anticipate by the time there will be uh, 200 to 500 nodes in the uh, lunar space. These assets may be in the form of rovers, robots, uh, infrastructure like uh, repeaters, beacons, and uh, several such things are likely to come out. So where the information flow has to be managed, regulated, and uh, securely delivered, this information system will form a framework. We have several um, partners which are lining up, in, and we'll probably also get to work with AMSAT uh, Network and uh, several others. We use the Google Hangout as the tool right now, and we are fine-tuning as we speak. It, our website is not up yet, but uh, you will be able to identify and locate all the previous sessions that's happening. And it does. Pro we do it weekly, and it has the facility to do simultaneous streaming as well as interactivity up to about five uh, panelists. Um, in the end, when the library of uh, Collections that we'll come up with will have a reference designs, architecture, some guides to methodology, and best practices. These are the areas that we target. Okay, and uh, uh, please join at Lunar Cubes. Uh, pardon me, the Lunar Network SIG, uh, dot com or whatever that would be. Yeah, and it's easily locatable at the Google. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, they said we'll be putting up uh, websites for most of these. And we can sign up sheets sign up out together. there. For those in the room, there are sign up sheets. Uh, right. For those uh, uh, in a recording or whatever, th there will be ways for you to go find this. If you, if you start at uh, the Lunar Workshops or LunarWorkshops.com or LunarCubes.com, any of our websites will eventually lead you back to these SIGs. One of the things I just wanted to point out 
one of the objects that's that's going to be going on in uh, Abraham's group is making networks out of existing uh, assets. So right now, most people think of the moon as being there's no one there except maybe the Chinese just got there a little while ago. But uh, there's actually two Artemis spacecraft and the LRO spacecraft, and they'll both be there for another decade or so. On this list, uh, the Chinese will almost certainly do a, a Chandrayaan has a, an orbiter, the Russians have an orbiter, the Koreans have an orbiter. So within a few years, there's going to be a lot of assets in cislunar space. And so one of the ideas is how do we create a market out of the unused capacity of all those assets, whether they're ground or surface uh, or orbiters. Initially, everybody will want to do their own thing. But just as happened at Mars, once you're there, collaborating starts to make sense. And so um, Abraham coming out of Silicon Valley is focused on things like uh, um, standards and connectivity and, and uh, service pr provision systems uh, that will be the foundation of that work. So that's the SIGs, and as we said, we've gotten several of them uh, up and running. Uh, we'll, we'll be formalizing their structure and, and make it a lot easier for you to sign up and participate uh, over the course of the next few months. And then over the course of the next few years, we'll probably be growing it to, to like I said, I'd, I'd like to see as many as 10 or 15 SIGs uh, associated with uh, all the different things we're doing, because there's plenty of, plenty of opportunity. Um, and uh, uh, lots of different ways to look at uh, going back to the moon. Another thing we want to do, if you remember the theme for the Lunar Initiatives is creating a marketplace of solutions. Well, there's nothing, you know, no more obvious example than the Google Lunar X Prize or um, the original X Prize, which created Virgin Galactic, or the prize before that that, that uh, got Charles Lindbergh across the Atlantic. Um, prizes are very powerful ways of creating technology innovation. Uh, NASA has many, many challenges underway and more coming. And so we're going to try and plug into that. We've figured out a way that we can self-fund them if we have to. We can kickstart the prize money so you don't need a million dollars to start. You can run it like a lottery where you just collect a little more money every time you run a competition until somebody wins. So there are a variety of ways that we can inexpensively, even with just our own resources, begin creating prizes. Um, we will start with some Kickstarters we're going to, Pamela talked about working with planetary systems, we're going to start seeing if we can't go raise a little money to start building the first couple of lunar cubes on our own and probably get them flown on the astrobotic lander with planetary systems deployment boxes. We'll certainly start working on those problems soon. And again, the idea is a, a couple of years from now, if you remember the, the calendar I put up at the beginning, the challenges probably won't really start until sometime next year. Um, but this will be a major part of what we're up to. Uh, and then there'll probably be a couple associated with each one. So the challenge is the idea, if, we, if we're self-funding, we'll also be submitting a proposal to the NASA uh, Centennial Challenges. They have an open proposal now, and Abraham and I have started work on a couple, um, and we'll probably submit before, uh, we have till December, we plan to submit uh, towards the end of the summer um, a couple of things. And so there's an entire possi entirely possible that our organization will be part of a NASA Centennial Challenge within a year or two. Uh, we'll also talk to uh, the XPRIZE Foundation see if they'd like to underwrite one of our programs. Or in this model, we can do it ourselves. You crowdsource the prize. You create annual uh, games and competitions. You have intermediate prizes and intermediate uh, ways of getting people excited. Um, and over time, through sponsors and donations, you build up the, the, the prize. The normal, the way you want to design a prize is you set a goal that you think will take at least three to five years to, to achieve. Um, and then you run the games and the competitions over those three to five years, raising more and more prize money each year, giving away a little bit so that nobody goes home empty-handed for doing good work. But ultimately, the big prize money builds over time, as I said, very much like a lottery would. Um, and uh, lots of sponsorship opportunities, lots of different ways you look at any of the robotics uh, uh, competitions or NASCAR, there's lots of ways to get people to donate lots of money and, and resources for things that look like uh, races and games. So here's an example of one that I thought of. These are just kind of off the cuff, my first thoughts. Um, like I said, Abraham and I have done a little bit of work on some of these. This is one we've done some work on. Um, the idea of, of the, the new MacBook Pro or the Mac Pro is a pretty stunning computer. Uh, definitely would have been considered a supercomputer 20 years ago when I was doing compu uh, computer stuff. 
Um, and so the question is, could you take as the performance guide the new Mac, and can you put it in a one cube format? And then can you make it operate it down to something like 40 Kelvin? And then can you make it run at 10 watts peak power? Right now, it's, I think, 10 watts idle power. So those are some pretty challenging goals. It probably would take somebody three to five years to meet most of those. Um, and we would have intermediate prices and things in, in different ways. But that's an example of something that um, there are lots of people out there. Uh, again, for example, like the cryogenic challenge, 40 Kelvin could probably only be done by a major university or, or lab. But we could easily, lots of people can work at 77 Kelvin. Uh, and we could also set up a, a set of criteria where you could compete at room temperature uh, and not win the whole prize, but part of it. So again, they can be very flexible. Another feature of the way, the way I'd like to organize the challenges is you do that. As I said, you pick a, a goal that you think would take three to five years for someone to actually achieve, say, six out of 10 um, of your objectives to win the prize. When they cross that, threshold, then it becomes somebody hits the, the key core challenges. Then the way I like to organize these is now you've got six months. And everybody else who's been competing in the intermediate challenges, it's the real competition begins once one person completes all the goals or most of the goals. Then you say, OK, whoever has the best system six months from now or nine months from now, they get the million bucks. And so there are ways to make these really exciting and, and really cool. And you can, you know, if you're doing that kind of thing and you're talking about computers on the moon and you've got a couple of million dollar prize, now you can do things like, you know, reality TV shows and all kinds of stuff. So it could get pretty exciting. This was, we mentioned cryogenic flywheels before. Uh, Wacon Shu at University of Houston has a little flywheel that just happens to be right about a 1U size. It was built as a laboratory example. So it wouldn't actually win this prize, but it is certainly proof that you can do it. Um, and so again, we'd go through and, and juice up the things. We you know, make sure it has to operate all cold, all of the electronics, all of the bearings. Right now, when people build superconducting flywheels, only the magnet is cold. Everything else is at room temperature. This is what I call cold design. Everything, all the electronics, all the batteries, all, you know, every, everything in the system has to operate at 40 Kelvin. Um, you know, so it fits into the 1U form factor. And maybe we talk about you need to be able to gang them together to create an array. So we can create a variety of aspects that, again, would probably take, uh, you know, this would, would almost certainly come out of universities' um, teams. But there are individuals who could do something pretty close to this. Like I said, they'd have a hard time getting down to 40 Kelvin. But they could certainly do all the mechanical engineering and get close with 77 Kelvin technology. And then maybe we let them come to NASA at Kennedy and, and work in a 40 Kelvin environment to get the rest of the way. Um, so that's, that's the challenges, and those are two examples. And the idea is with each of the different types of workshops, we would come up with different types of challenges to promote the technologies that are going on inside the special interest groups that are going on at the workshops. Coming out of this, so the workshops and the special interest you know, kind of the workshops create papers. People come and present their progress and what they'd like to do next. The special interest groups create proposal teams and people get together and talk about what they are doing and what can we do together. The challenges are going to create real hardware and real systems that work and solve problems. After that, you want to create companies. After that, you want to find investors and you want to incubate. If somebody builds one of these products, either the flywheel or the 40 Kelvin cube, um, maybe they want to start a company. Maybe they want to be co go commercial. And so within a few years, two or three years from now, we're already actually working with some incubators in the Bay Area, and in particular one also in Sacramento. So we're beginning to network with, with other people's incubators. But uh, one of my objectives I, when I got started, I was an entrepreneurial coach, and raising capital was, was kind of my background uh, six, seven years ago. And so I'm looking forward to getting back into that role of creating capital, creating companies, creating um, uh, profitable, sustainable systems. Uh, so we'll do that. So the, the incubator structure is you provide banking. So giving a credit card to a startup is a challenging thing, and, and somebody like you know Mastercard shouldn't be doing it. But they still need to be able to have good kinds of banking, good kinds of of, of uh, ways of organizing their work while they're in this incredibly chaotic and failure-prone environment. 
So we know how to do banking, the basic uh, cash flow sort of banking. Then we know how to do asset creation and collection. So that's things like patents and other kinds of things. Entrepreneurial training, training engineers to be complete risk takers, complaining engineers to go back to training engineers to go back to the world like the early days of Ranger where 50% failure rate was doing pretty good. Um, a lot of people are going to need to get back to that kind of world um, and a lot of scientists and engineers in planetary science can't imagine that kind of world. So they'll need a lot of training uh, uh, and we'll be providing that kind of support both in terms of how do you do entrepreneurial engineering as well as entrepreneurial team formation and building businesses. And then that creates, so then in order to do this, one of the first things you do is you create a virtual institute, very much like Survey, around their technology. So if you want to do superconducting flywheels, you create something that has workshops and SIGs. And for us, the lunar initiatives are the virtual institutes already, um, where people are starting to work on the problems we care about. Um, and then as those problems become closer to solutions, then you turn to the open source community and the maker community, and then you go and create start startups and skunk works to actually build stuff and learn how to sell it. So that's the structure of it. Uh, the Lunar Networks Incubator is an example of one that, that we thought through a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, the idea is, is looking for shared communication, shared power, shared computing, shared navigation, built out of the kinds of assets that are already in the cislunar space or new things that we might build. Here's some examples of really simple things that could, that could, you know, maybe not be full companies, but could start making money. So you could do some little marketing things, like uh, you send a tweet and it gets bounced off the moon, and, and you know, so your your uh, Valentine's Day gift to your wife is, is I love you, honey. This came from the moon, uh, and so there are a variety of other little things that could be fairly inexpensive and fairly short range um, ways of, like I said, utilizing the assets that are there or coming up with very small, simple things. Um, and I'm guessing that's my last slide. Um, so that's an overview of, the, of two of the new components, the special interest groups, and then how the special interest groups grow into creating sustainable, profitable companies and other kinds of projects like this. And so you can see the flow. We begin with workshops that just get people in the room and get some publicity. Then from those people, we build the special interest groups to get them collaborating, working with each other over time uh, in a regular way, growing their careers and their businesses by doing proposals and papers. From there, you now organize them into challenge teams that are out to build stuff and win prizes and big money. And then from there, you try and create and organize startups and different types of assets. Uh, so that is um, where we're headed and, and where, where we're going with the Lunar Initiatives and the more capital and business side of what we're trying to create here. So, so thank you for your time.